Are you a new blogger trying to figure out how to monetize your blog? Or maybe you're an experienced blogger, but you're looking for new ways to increase the revenue on your existing blog posts. In today's video, I'm going to cover the seven ways to monetize your blog. My name is Casey, and I'm the founder of bloggingguide.com. In addition to showing you how to monetize your blog in this video, I'm also going to include seven examples one for each of the different monetization methods that I'll discuss. The first method of blog monetization is the use of display ads. Display ads are basically just the online advertisements that you see in a blog post. So these are the videos or sometimes the images that you see in the sidebar, in the adhesion slot, or in content. There are a few major benefits to using display ads. First and foremost, it's really easy to implement them. On probably the easiest of the platforms, Google AdSense, you can literally get started by just adding a snippet of code to the back end of your website. You don't have to actually sell the ads or negotiate any sort of contract. All of these display ad networks are programmatic and they take care of that for you. The second major benefit is that the whole income process is largely passive. So once you create a site and as long as it's receiving traffic, you'll continue to make money. The third benefit is the overall low barrier to entry. Pretty much anyone can do this. There's no firm traffic minimum. Uh, there's no upfront fixed cost. Basically, really, uh, anyone with a site that's over six months old and has at least 30 to 50 posts can use display ads to make money. Some of the drawbacks. Uh, even though anyone technically can make money with display ads, in order to earn higher RPMs, or that's the rate per thousand page views, you'll need to be accepted into higher tier ad networks. And for these ad networks like Mediavine or Raptive, you do need certain levels of traffic. Once you get these levels of traffic though, you do earn more. So it's definitely worth going after, but it is a drawback that, you know, at first you're only gonna make so much with your Google AdSense or other sort of basic ad network earnings. And then the other drawback, which is bit of an unknown, but that's really just the whole state of third-party cookies. Third-party cookies are basically just the data that advertisers are able to collect currently, and it allows them to target or retarget ads. Third-party cookies, though, are being phased out in 2024. And since we're still at the beginning of the year, we don't know the exact effect some people think that the overall RPMs are going to drop for display advertising. A lot of this will depend on your strategy. If you're collecting first party data, chances are you'll probably be fine. But again, this will depend on your own individual strategy. But generally speaking, display ads are probably the most popular and sort of the go to method for blog. As an example of a site that has display ads for the monetization method, I found this website called braidhairstyles.com. And as you can see in the green boxes, both in the header of the website and in content, there are a number of display ads. So there are video ads, adhesion ads, which are the ones on the bottom bar, there's sidebar ads and in content ads. So this is a good example, uh, maybe a bit heavy on the use of ads, but this is basically just reference what a display ad website looks like. The second monetization method is affiliate marketing. There's a number of benefits to affiliate marketing. Compared to the previous method, display ads, affiliate marketing has one major advantage. It works with very little traffic. And that's mainly because you can earn more from the traffic that you do get. The other benefits are that it's overall still easy to implement, much like display ads. 
for affiliate marketing. You basically just sign up for an affiliate program. They'll provide you with a link that enables them to track sales and conversions of a product that they own or are promoting. You include this link in one of your articles. Someone clicks on the link and if they make a purchase or even if they don't, depending on the specifics of the program, you'll basically earn a commission. And the second other point is that this is all largely passive. So once you actually set this up, once you publish an article with an affiliate link, it's pretty much you're going to be earning money um, as long as the site's earning some level of traffic. Obviously, it's still ideal to have high volume of traffic, but the the overall model works potentially with less traffic. Display ads, on the other hand, require large amounts of traffic. So why not just do affiliate marketing? Well, there are a few disadvantages, and the main problems come from sort of the structure of the programs themselves, mainly that the programs can abruptly end or change terms. If you've used Amazon Associates or know anyone who has, you probably have heard about the rates being slashed. Amazon holds a lot of leverage since they're the final platform where people buy a lot of products. And for a long time, affiliate marketers made a lot promoting products that were on Amazon. But Amazon has all the leverage now, and they keep gradually decreasing the affiliate rates. And as an affiliate, while you don't have to promote their specific products, Amazon has such a large selection. There's all this buyer trust. Basically, you know, your conversion rate won't be as good if you choose another product. And by Amazon cutting the rate, you earn less. This is all out of your control. And it can be frustrating. The other thing, too, is that if you're dealing with a smaller affiliate program, the affiliate program simply might have issues making payments to you. They might be delayed or they might at some point just cut off the program. This happens sometimes when people do exceptionally well with an affiliate program and they're smaller and they want to keep all the money for themselves, which is why I generally would advise new bloggers to stick with fairly well-known affiliate programs or ones that, uh, basically transact through major platforms like impact radius because these these platforms basically hold them a little bit more uh, to account so a good example of uh, an affiliate site is wirecutter wirecutter's uh publication now owned by the new york times but it started off as an independent blog and basically it's a massive review site um, focusing on sort of tech and, I guess, home products, uh, but especially tech products. So there are lots of review articles. And as you can see on that left slide in the green box, they even, it's very obvious they're an affiliate uh, site because they have their affiliate disclaimer basically at the very top of their home page. So that's a sign that this is obviously an affiliate site and some of those daily deals listed on the right hand side of the page literally just lead you to like an amazon affiliate link so that's most of what this site is and where a lot of the revenue comes from and you can see an example of how they generally do that which is in that right panel so you can see they have um articles recommend basically reviewing a product and then usually they'll have since they cover just about everything they'll have related or everything we recommend sections and they'll put their recommendations and since they have relationships with just about everyone there's probably an affiliate program that allows them to sell it and if you click on that link they'll get a commission so this is probably a bit more over the top than most affiliate sites are. Most sites try to mix, do a mix of info and affiliate content or, or 
basically info and buyer sort of purchase intent content. But uh, Wirecutter is a good example. If you just want to see how to structure reviews or see sort of how different affiliate programs work. The third example of blog monetization is incorporating digital products into your blog. So digital products can actually include a lot of things. This is probably the most broad of the categories I'll mention. So digital products includes things like courses, eBooks, memberships, stock photos, content libraries, or even services. And overall, what sort of connects all these things is that the actual deliverable, the thing that you purchase and then receive as a consumer is usually a file that you're, or series of files or database that you access. So this leads to the number of benefits, which are you generally have low overhead costs. If you had a brick and mortar store and you were selling any of these things or the physical equivalent of these things, you would have sales, you know, staff, you would have your, you know, rent for your store every month, you'd have uh, packing, shipping, you'd have all these different expenses that come with shipping and dealing in physical products. So the overhead of an e-commerce or in this case, digital product store is much less. Um, Generally to the profit margins are a lot higher. So if you sell a course, you probably, you know, other than your, you know, you probably invest a heavy amount of time up front. But once you create the course, you are basically able to infinitely sell that um, with no marginal cost. So it depends a little bit on the distribution platform you use, but there are free platforms. So generally, that this allows you to have very high uh, profit margins. If you were to sell, let's say, pottery uh, in a traditional store, and you sell, let's say, like a pot for twenty dollars, you know, it probably costs you ten dollars to make the pot. Maybe another five dollars in overhead and labor to produce it, a few dollars to ship it, and maybe you're at the end of it only making a 10, 20 percent profit margin on the final product. And that doesn't factor in returns or chargebacks or other disputes. So uh, yeah, the fact that you can make like 90 plus percent profit margins on a digital product is a pretty substantial advantage. And then the third kind of big benefit is the potential to automate. So if you have a digital product, one of the best things is that you can automate the actual sale of the digital product because it's a standard product. It's a single and non-unique file that you're able to sell over and over. So yeah, if you had a, to compare it with like, again, the pottery example, if you have a business selling pottery, it's going to be really hard to automate that. You could outsource or hire people to run the business, but to fully automate the process, you know, there's people importing the materials, people assembling it, people shipping it out, people dealing with customer service, all that. Whereas if you have a digital product, you're not really dealing with any of that. You put it up typically on a site and people can just download the product and usually you can you can pick a site that costs little to no money. You might have to pay a little money to distribute it, but once you upload the file, they handle the distribution, they send out the confirmation, the email, and yeah, they collect the payments, they provide the payment gateway, and this is just a great source of what what can become essentially passive income. But it's not perfect, so what are the drawbacks? Well, usually uh, a good digital product, at least, requires a fairly large investment of your time up front. So if you're selling products one-off, uh, 
like the physical products, you may not be making a lot, but you can kind of immediately start seeing some profit on that first sale. Whereas if you value your time correctly, since that's usually the biggest input with a digital product, if you're, let's say, creating a course, you might have to spend 500 hours building that course. You might have to spend money launching it on a certain platform. You might have to spend money researching or providing tools. You might have to spend some initial money on marketing. So once you get it going, it'll function pretty much uh, fully autonomously. But if you, yeah, if you evaluate the real cost of producing the product up front, which is usually very heavy on time, a course, like I said, can take easily several hundred hours and a lot of expertise. That's a pretty substantial investment. So you don't want to overlook that. So this is a, an example of a digital product. It's basically a series of mid-journey prompts and they're sold on a site called Gumroad, which is a site I've used before and would recommend mainly for people that are new and adding products because while their fees aren't the lowest, they on the actual transaction side, they are totally free to list. Um, so basically, yeah, you create an account, you can list your products, you upload them as a PDF, MP4, whatever, you know, even just a link to a private YouTube video and people can pay through Gumroad. They handle all the payments with Stripe and yeah, you can sell your digital product, which in this case can be as simple as prompts for a AI image generation tool or something like mid journey. So this is a great example and you can, if you need ideas, you can Gumroad's a great place to look because they're pretty much all digital products. But this is a good example because all these prompts are things that someone just probably figured out through trial and error and jotted down their favorite prompts that they started using over and over. And over time, they add them to a Google Doc and save them. And yeah, at some point they were like, this is useful for other people, so I'll sell it. So if you had a blog about like graphic design, about image production, about you know digital publishing, you could offer this product for sale and this would integrate really pretty seamlessly with your blog. The fourth example of digital product for bloggers are events. And again, this is a little bit of a broad category. Um, events can include webinars, mastermind groups, or even in-person events. So this, again, is broad, but what kind of ties all these together is that you're facilitating people coming together, people spending time together, usually people that are subject matter experts. So what are the benefits of offering any of these as a blogger? Well, for starters, they're highly lucrative. If you have a mastermind group, if you have a webinar, these are things that whether people are paying up front in the case of a mastermind group, or they're ultimately being funneled to your product in the case usually of a webinar, they're paying a lot usually for that, that privilege or that product. So these are definitely big sales that you can make. And the other benefit is that unlike communities, which we'll get to in a little bit, there is some scalability to this. So a webinar, for example, does not have to be unique every time. Uh, a mastermind group usually requires your input, but again, you can you could sort of franchise this out. You could offer different subgroups and you know people can start to form their own and you can sort of do like a franchise model. Um, the in-person events are probably the least scalable. But again, those offer a lot of 
a lot of profit potentially if you can bring people together with the subject matter on your blog. So what are the drawbacks here? Well, th these are all extremely time intensive. So generally I would say none of these are passive. Um, they all require some level of sales skill uh, or really just interpersonal skills. You need to be able to connect with people, communicate effectively, and that's very different than display ads or affiliate or even digital products. Because with digital products, you can pick the way you communicate with people. With affiliate marketing and display ads, you just pretty much produce traditional written content and some visual content. But for webinars, masterminds, assuming they're not in person, you are holding conference calls. You're, again, mediating and sort of wrangling people. So that's a different skill set. And the other drawback is that typically the events require some level of ongoing support. So even if you have a once a month mastermind, there's probably questions and follow-ups people will have after it. And if you're the one facilitating that, you're going to be the person that the people attending events are going to reach out to. And that's what kind of goes, you know, with the territory. If it's an in-person event, yeah, and people want to follow up about potential sales, then yeah, you're going to have to be able to respond to those and, you know, continue to plan for the next one. So again, this can be lucrative and it's definitely a good idea. But this is a high effort and I would say fairly time intensive uh, income stream to add to your blog. Here's an example of a mastermind group, basically. So this is the Platinum Mastermind Group. And basically you have lots of people that are focused on sales in some level. There's people that are digital publishers, people that are management consultants, lots of different types of professionals that rely on sales. And so if you want to get better at sales, if you want to learn the art of writing really good sales copy, there are groups like this. And while I haven't attended this group in particular, uh, this is one of those ones that comes up on a lot of lists. And Again, it shows why this can be lucrative. Uh, I believe when I looked into this, it could be closer to 10,000 a year to attend uh, some of these events or to have an annual membership. So that just goes to show that if you're really, really willing to build something um, outside your blog, but you can use your blog to start generating traffic for it, then you can make a lot of money for sure doing these high dollar events. Fifth example of an income stream that bloggers can add is consulting or coaching services. And you probably have seen this on a lot of people's blogs. They'll have a services section, uh, especially if you have like a personal blog. So like, for example, on my blog, Blogging Guide, I have a services section where if you want me to audit your website and do some amount of research on ways you can improve and then do a video call, you can pay a fixed amount. That's a good example of consulting services. And so what are the benefits of this model? Well, it's one of the higher ROI, ROI ways to monetize your knowledge or skills, assuming you're a subject matter expert. You do have to be a subject matter expert usually. Um, but not necessarily. If you keep your price low enough, people will probably still be interested. But if you are, if you do have some expertise, if you are an accredited professional of some kind, or if you just know something really well, and people are already reading your blog content, they already have some level of trust built with you, they might want to reach out and ask, you know, uh, questions that would be way too detailed or situation specific for you to answer in your post. Um, so this is a good way to 
to connect with your audience and really answer their questions and address their needs. And sometimes people just want what are typically more the coaching services, which are basically maybe they need someone who's an expert, but they also want really just like a, an accountability partner, someone they can check in with on their progress, who understands the industry once a week. And if you do the coaching side of things, recurring revenue is possible because if you have appointments every week, you'll be charging for each one. So what are the drawbacks to this? Well, the biggest one is that this is very time intensive. So unlike the previous uh, methods to monetize your blog, this is not passive at all. You are directly trading time for money. That said, you are earning a lot of money typically. So, you know, it, it can be a great thing to add. It's a totally valid income stream. But keep in mind that, yeah, you if the goal is passive income, this may not be the right uh, income stream to add to your blog. The other drawback is that it's not really scalable. So yes, you can always build a company and hire people to provide a similar service. You can train them, give them SOPs, but that's kind of a different level of this. For an individual blogger, there's only one of you and there's only you know 24 hours in a day. So you can only you know be providing services to people for those you know during those hours. Uh, it doesn't scale. It's not like if you did a video course where you distilled all your knowledge and you recorded it once and then people could pay for it infinitely. They uh, they have personalized questions and they need help and each call requires you to be present. Um, and I guess the other kind of drawback is that this does usually require some level of subject matter expertise. So you, if, if you are writing a blog and you're not that knowledgeable about the topic, or you just sort of have a superficial level of knowledge, maybe you're just sort of generically reviewing something, people might not be as likely to contact you for coaching or consulting services. So in other words, this lends itself to people that are in certain industries and have certain skills. So it may not be applicable to everyone, but if it is, coaching and consulting are great options for bloggers. So here's an example of someone offering fairly typical uh, coaching or consulting services. This is Laura Cooperman. Um, basically, she's offering a one-on-one -on -one coaching session. And again, it kind of encompasses everything. It could be you asking questions and looking for guidance or support. Um, if you want it to be an ongoing thing, as I mentioned, like more of the coaching side, there's she mentions that accountability, cheerleading, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and on the consulting side, she can also offer tools, resources, or worksheets. So basically, this is pretty typical of what you see. It's usually related to someone's personal brand. Uh, but it could be their business too, but this is great if you have a personal site like this, where it's a first name, last name.com. This is basically the, the model that a lot of people follow. And it's great because you don't really have to worry too much about generating targeted leads because p if people are coming to your site already, if you have traffic, there's a good chance they're interested in what you have to say. So it's sort of a good self-selection that occurs naturally. Also, on a side note, these are really good, I think, as a way to sort of diversify your business against traffic updates because ultimately coaching or consulting is very lucrative and you only need a very small amount of traffic for this to potentially work. The traffic that goes here, you know, there's no display ads or 
probably even any affiliate links on here, but this certainly earns more than it would if she were running uh, display ads or affiliate links. The sixth idea for bloggers looking to add a new monetization method to their blog is adding a paid community. And there are a number of benefits to paid communities. They're extremely lucrative. Um, this is probably, if done at scale correctly, the most lucrative of the opportunities on here, other than maybe courses in some cases. Uh, by creating a paid community, you're also building a large moat. It's very difficult to replicate a community. I mean, once you have a community, you can easily cross sell virtually anything. So uh, companies spend a lot to build communities and have engaged users who return to their content again and again. And the third benefit is that it's very easy to add on additional streams of income. And by that, I mean, you can have ads in a community, you can have affiliate links, you know, if people trust you, and if people are going to your private forum every day, they'll probably want to click on your resources page, they probably trust you, and they probably will buy your subsequent courses or ebooks, or templates or whatever. So there's a lot of upside if you can build a paid community. But that's a big if and that's where the drawbacks come in. So first, it's very hard to build. Um, the I actually worked for a tech startup that was building software for community builders. And the thing we struggled with the most was not creating like high quality content or even selling the service. Lots of people saw value in building a community. But for anyone to build a community, it takes years usually of hard work. It requires you to be the right type of person. You have to be that central node where everybody goes to you or you have some huge audience for enabled to sort of funnel them to your own third party platform. And that gets into the next point, which is it's very uh, hard to maintain an online community. So yeah, sure, people will maybe visit a page once, and this could be like an article on your blog, but and maybe they even create an account and sign into your private community. But it's it's very hard to get them to come back. You need the right topic. It has to have a certain has to be sticky. It has to get people to want to come back there once a week or every day, ideally, that eliminates a lot of topics, or you'd have to do a phenomenal amount of work to facilitate conversations and other events online to justify people spending their time there. You're basically competing with the likes of a, a top Facebook group, which I don't like a lot of Facebook groups, but everybody has Facebook. So that's why it's such a big moat because nobody else is a part of your forum so getting them on there is like half the battle and then the last point is that actually monetizing it is tricky so the best way to get people to a com community is to first make it free or have some level of free access just like if you wanted people to get your content you don't put it right behind a paywall but at some point you need to basically upsell them and convincing people to pay, especially since communities are usually a large one-time fee or it's a decent recurring fee. That, that's really tricky. Um, I, I basically, yeah, I, I, I don't see many examples of this. This is the kind of thing, if you can do this, this is like the Holy grail of the creator economy. So there's, extreme benefits to this, but this is definitely the most challenging of the monetization models mentioned in this video. To give you an example of a paid community that was added on sort of to a, a website or blog would actually be the Fat Stacks forum. And some of you, because we're talking about blogging might be familiar with this. I'm a member of this forum, which is why I'm using this as an example. 
and basically fat stacks is this forum where site builders and bloggers digital publishers all come together and discuss making money through digital publishing and yeah i spend a lot of time on here uh and so did the other users usually people find like the sales page as seen on the left and you read through a series of like elaborate testimonials and you see all these crazy earning screenshots and you know you're enticed you know i want to get into this with this group of people that are you know doing the same thing as me so this almost falls in that again professional or career track but making money online yeah is certainly a good niche um but very hard to build now on the right there you can see like there's a lot of activity so even though the founder john is not involved in every discussion this community over the past few years has grown to the point where there's people that for free are basically like moderators are regular posters i did my first case study on this private forum so i mean there's a lot of value in these in these paid communities again you know for every one of these though there's definitely 99 that tried the same idea and failed so in john's case with fat stacks the the key was he had all the proof he had the screenshots he had the earnings he had a system he had a course and that gets back to the previous slide where i was talking about cross-selling really this is a hybrid of a course and a community so everyone gets access to the forum some people come for the course and then discover they like the forum some people may not need the course but they just want to join the forum which is kind of where i was at either way it's good that everybody's on the same page has had like the same base level of training so this is a really good example of a paid community so the seventh and last of the monetization models that i'll cover is rank and rent so what is rank and rent basically you similar to all these models but different in the execution you focus on using search engine optimization typically to rank for some topic sometimes this is hyper local so these might be ranking for local businesses but it could be trying to rank for your tech blog let's say and if you have a let's say article on the best video conference software and you list have a listicle and you list 10 of your preferred forms of software at some point someone might contact you from one of those 10 or from somebody who more likely is not even on that list perhaps an up-and-coming you know startup and they'll say hey how much money to get on this list and you can basically charge them and potentially make a lot um so that gets into the benefits of this so it can be supported by a smaller source of traffic this is true in the when you look at local spaces if you're like trying to rank for best realtor you know your city the, the odds are there's actually not a ton of competition so it's fairly easy to rank um, even in a pretty major city with some reasonable SEO skills. And that means that, you know, basically, yeah, people do search for those queries in order to find professionals. So basically you can make a lot more um, by having a small source of traffic because basically each of those leads are worth a lot more. They convert at a very high rate. Um, high recurring revenue. If you do the software example that I previously mentioned, you have a chance not only to charge a lot to maybe put someone on that list or even number one or something like that, but you have the option of like basically, yeah, you, you set the pricing. It's a private deal. So a lot of times the, 
the better people at Rank and Rent will be charging, let's say, a thousand or five thousand dollars a month, depending on like the traffic that your article gets and the conversions and all that. But if you have the right article, you can, you know, you can basically even go to these uh, different partners and show them the data and say, hey, I can get you 8,000 clicks a month with a 3% conversion rate on your $500 product. And that's why this is worth like 3,000 a month or whatever. So there's definitely potential for recurring revenue because once they get a taste of those leads or sales from your article, they'll probably continue to pay you. And this is hard to do, but if you can do it, then you'll continue to earn money, you know, month after month. And the third benefit is that it's typically easier since it involves local SEO. Now that that excludes the example I just mentioned, but if, like I said, you're doing like services. So if you're creating a site, just trying to rank for lawn care in Arlington, Virginia, or you know, tree removal in Madison, Wisconsin. These are basically easy to rank for because the people creating these pages are typically service providers and they don't have a lot of SEO experience. And frankly, there's not even that many of them usually in the area. If you pick a city with the right level of uh, population density. So ultimately, anyone could get started with this and the ceiling is much higher. You could earn huge amounts of money doing this. And there's some really cool people you can search for on YouTube who are doing this, but this isn't my current model for most of my sites, but I do think it's a, a valid and a sort of future proof model that I'll be looking at more and more, but there are some drawbacks. So, you basically need to set up a partnership in order for this to work. You're negotiating this deal with a company and they're paying you a bunch of money. There's obviously going to be challenges in there. You basically need some level of sales expertise. I mean, if you want to just produce content click publish and move on and get paid display ads or affiliates marketing are great you can earn money that way and you never have to interact with a single person if you don't want to but rank and rent involves creating real partnerships a lot of times with real physical brick and mortar businesses so you have to be okay whether that's getting on the phone maybe email or maybe even going down to you know, your local hardware store or whatever, and talking to someone and selling them on this. And there's all sorts of variations of this, but in general, you're creating a real partnership. So you have to trust each other. There's just, yeah, a lot more hurdles sort of when getting started. And again, you, you do need real sales experience. Ultimately, if, if this was, if, if, if sales weren't the sort of barrier here, everybody would do it. But because sales is a pretty good barrier, most people who are interested in making money online have no interest in this. Now, usually you'd build a blog explicitly for the purpose of rank and rent as opposed to adding this on. But if you have something, again, like I said, with products, like I said, a tech blog, a gardening blog, you know, even travel blog, there are companies and services that once you have the traffic and the data, you can justify selling them basically the, the rank on your page. So I think this is a great strategy for bloggers, but it's definitely one of the more nuanced and complicated of the monetization methods mentioned here. And just to drive this home, here's an example of a rank and rent site. Uh, I, you probably see these all the time and just don't even know that's what they are. That's sort of the, 
the beauty of them is they're sort of hiding in plain sight. So this is Grand Rapids Tree Removal Service. And so this is actually uh, a larger company that does huge amounts of rank and rent sites. I was just searching for some of the text in the footer and I found this site. So they do these in cities all across America and they basically rank for your local tree services. So that's like stump removals, you know, branches needing to be trimmed, uh, all sorts of things like that. And they rank and they basically start collecting leads from interested buyers or clients. And you can see on the right side, that's where that lead generation form or that phone number is. And basically they'll directly funnel those leads to local businesses. Usually they give them the first few for free um, just to prove that they're actually adding value to your business. But once that business gets used to getting some of these new leads, um, yeah, usually they're willing to sit down and talk to you about paying for it. The specific price will vary depending on the service offered. Um, I think the, the tree removal is a pretty good uh, rank and rent niche to be in. But there's, again, all sorts of examples. But again, this is hyper-local. There's not a ton of competition. I checked this out before, and I'm, I'm pretty sure anybody with basic SEO experience could throw together a website like this and outrank this. But again, the real key here is having the marketing and sort of sales business experience to know how to make the right connections, how to pitch the leads, how to track the leads, all that. So I think this is a good example of a rank and rent site. Thanks for watching my video on the different monetization methods available to bloggers. Whether you're a brand new blogger thinking about creating a specific blog that focuses on one of these, or you're an experienced blogger looking to basically boost the earnings associated with your current traffic, I hope you found these useful and maybe they gave you some creative ideas. Lots of the best versions of monetization come from a hybrid of these. So feel free to experiment mix and match or do slight variations of them. But these seven models all work. I've pretty much done them all personally. And yeah, they're, they're definitely legitimate sources of income. So if you want to learn more, you can always just check out my website blogging guide or reach out to me on social media at Casey Botticello. Thanks again for watching and be sure to like and subscribe.